All right, there we go. Let's see if it put it on Facebook or not. I'm going to check the Facebook group really quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go run and grab a document then I have okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll just kind of give people a minute. All right, I see it up on Facebook, so it's working. <laughs> Hopefully other people will see it. Um, so I guess we'll just go ahead and get started and as people come in, they can listen. And then I know there's a bunch of people that said they would just watch the replay because they can't be here like during it. So right. if you want to introduce yourself and what you do and just a little bit about your background for everyone, that would be great. Okay, uh, my name is Doyle. I'm a crop scientist or a sustainable food scientist is what my degree is under. Um, I'm also uh, the owner of uh, Sustainable Sanctuary. I'm a garden and agricultural consultant, and I deal with uh, community gardens, uh, English and French protégé garden, uh, farmer's markets, and I deal with soil health management and all that stuff. So if anyone has any questions that I can possibly answer, and if I can't answer them right now, then I can definitely get back to people. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a website or anything that I could add in later? Um, I have my business card with um, now I'm working on a book. Okay. So I don't have it yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with, let me pull up my questions here. Um, just some of the basic ones. I kind of went through, there's some specific questions and then like some general overarching mm -hmm. questions that I saw. So one of the things that I saw a bunch of people asking about, because um, there's a lot of people that are just getting started and don't necessarily have a lot of land or anything yet, was container and vertical gardening. So if you have any like tips or ideas to get people started in a small space. Okay, so I garden on my deck. I live in a condo, so I'm obviously not going to um, garden outside, you know. I'm allowed to, actually we have lots of freedom here. So, um, but so I use earth boxes. And if no one knows what earth box is, it's a complete containment and it has um, a bottom part that is kind of blocked off from the soil so that uh, water can just kind of there so it holds like eight gallons of water and then another eight gallons of soil and you don't have to change the soil for eight seasons so that's awesome um so it has a tube and you water it a week or whatever and the it the soil just soaks up the water for what it needs um i just did a on trellising and so I had all the trellis, trellises that I use for containers and it's beautiful. It's not, um, and you don't do anything for it. You, you can make those earth boxes yourself. You don't even have to like go to earth box and buy them um, because they are a bit pricey. Um, and there's actually lots of stuff that you can find online to actually make your own. So, but yeah, vertical gardening is, is essentially just, trellising in a container right so people you trellis to produce more food and better airflow um and depending on what your your container looks like or even if it's in a raised bed raised beds you can still do lots of vertical gardening and trellising 
and uh, you know, use teepees and um, obelisks, but obelisks are more, they're a little bit fancier. Um, <laughs> but they're all under the, the category of, they're called tutors. And a tutor is the French term for trainer. So you're essentially training anything that causes a vine. So cucumbers with, you know, their little feelers and um, pumpkins. Uh, I would only do the smaller sugar pumpkins for trellising. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to do pumpkins, large pumpkins, I would suggest in a container. I did it last year in a community garden. Works great. Uh, I used a pallet, and you put a pallet as an A-frame trellis. So you put two pallets together so that the vine climbs up and then goes down. And then I had another pallet covered with straw, so it had a little bit of a, a pillow, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it caused like great airflow and everything else, and there was no powdery mildew. That's another thing. People like to trellis in containers because containers you always you're obviously you know have limited space, so you're crowded in. And vertical gardening, proper airflow, no powdery mildew. Well, not always. It depends on what kind of gardener. I have a bug in here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what kind of gardener you are, uh, or, you know, when I, when I say what kind of gardener you are, if you're a novice or are you an expert? So a novice sometimes just waters the whole entire plant and you're just kind of like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but, you know, and I've, I've encountered some gardeners are just like, oh, that's how I always garden. I'm just like, okay, do you ever have an issue with disease and pests? They're like, oh, yeah, all the time. I'm, I'm infested. I'm like, great. <laughs> That's what I have to go to. Great. Um, so, yeah, so you definitely want to get, you know, that that root, that good root watering and not touch the leaves. So that's why you want to do vertical gardening. But I have a whole presentation on that if if they want it. If, they, if I can just send it to them and they can see it for themselves for different trellising um, in different – containers or different raised beds or whatever. And um, and it's using stuff that's in your yard, right? So it's either in your yard or in your forest. Yeah. So it's not, you don't have to go out and buy anything special. Yeah. So you were just talking about watering um, and I kind of wanted to bring this up. So I've just started here cause I'm in high desert area. Like we're dry. And dry, we usually get 16 inches of rain a year and we've had like, three this year wow. so yeah it's pretty bad but um we just started drip irrigation here with mm -hmm. like emitters at the roots of everything yep. and that has been absolutely amazing because i've never i've like i came from georgia dealing with way too much water and all of the problems that that brings and then to here so where are you uh in montana southwest montana okay so whenever someone says montana to me i never think desert <laughs> yeah it's like this southwest area here it's so dry okay um, right. like you go to the mountains and there's a bit more rain and everything but where i am we get all of our moisture in the winter in the form of snow mm -hmm. and by the time it's growing season you it's have fine. nothing right yeah mm -hmm. okay so are you also doing uh, mulching yes uh i just mulched everything well everything that i've planted so far um, and then drip irrigation and raised beds because our ground is also a rock farm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I bet it is. Yeah. Um, but are you, is the mulch on top of the irrigation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got the kind that goes underneath. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But, you it's, know, I just... Really, really it, uh, a plant only really needs one inch of moisture per week. Um, yeah. because you want to, you know, you want anything soggy, right? And you obviously want your root system to be really strong. And in order to do that, it's kind of like tough love, you know, once yeah. a week, that's all you really need. You don't need anything more than that. Anything more than that, you're kind of spoiling them. Yeah. Yeah. They get a little, they get a little spoiled. We also have high winds. Like right now, I think we're at like 90 miles per hour outside winds. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> And you don't it's, have a hurricane. Yeah. This is probably one of the harshest climates to try and grow anything in. Oh, um, it's very safe. 
Yeah, we've got one. Actually, my stuff is doing great. It takes like once I put it in the ground, it takes about two weeks to acclimate and then it does amazing. But it's just a very interesting climate. It sounds it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you are doing you said you, you are doing a windscreen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I just have a horse trailer blocking the garden from the predominant wind. Okay. It works. It's what I had. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it works. I was gonna be like, you know, plant something that causes a windscreen, but hey, that you got that trailer and it works, then great. Yeah, yeah. We're putting in uh willow bushes, basket willow eventually, but that's just not in yet. Okay. So. Yeah. Around this area, people use abervites because they're fast growing. Yeah, we can't grow them here. <laughs> they just fall yeah. over. It's I too bet. dry. So. Yeah. Um, the basket willow does really well here, so that's what we're doing, and just gonna that's plant good. a bunch of basket willow everywhere. Yeah, hey, if it works, right? Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The problem here, we have uh, the deer love ibervite, so. Mm. So you have you, you deal with you know you give the back end to the deer and the nice part that's facing your yard, no one sees. So it's like, oh well, they can have the back end. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was just bringing up. I know someone also was asking about um, gardening in a drought too. So mm -hmm. I feel like uh, this is kind of like along those lines. So is there anything else that you would suggest doing for gardening during a drought? Well, well, for for California specifically, um, University of California actually has for their Agriculture and Natural Resources Department, they actually have a food garden action plan. So, um, I mean, they recommend, you know, compost is, is it, you know, holds in the, mo the most moisture. Uh, I strongly suggest the uh, water once a week type thing. That's it. Um, you know, compost and mulch. They said use a drip system um, and uh, be selective about what you're growing. Even for even like food, just be selective because there are, are variety of food do well in drought so yeah um yeah you, like you don't want the the crops that need consistent moisture obviously right um they said do i have uh i had some lots of research going on earlier today. <laughs> uh let's see here So beans, broccoli, shard, corn, cow pea, cucumbers, eggplant, melon, okra, pepper, squash, and very well drought. It's a lot still. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, if they're in Northern California, aren't they dealing with a lot of fires yeah. right now? I don't know if they have fires there yet. They usually do. I mean, that's right. my, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, if they wanted to, I mean, I know it's not, it's not laughable, but it kind of is because you, um, you're no longer planting to the seasons you're planting to the fire season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really? So, I mean, in early, early season, she can be growing, you know, spinach and, and lettuce and all those things because it's clear and, and there shouldn't be too many fires at that point. Um, and then, switch to the the vegetables that I stated for later on but she uh, definitely needs to do the those first items that I stated you know compost uh, get really good compost and the mulching and the drip irrigation and she doesn't even have to do like expensive drip irrigation you know yeah um, she can make oyas now an oya is an ancient watering technique that has been used since the Egyptians essentially, I've made them for my uh, my thesis for my first degree. I made uh, 52 of these actually. <laughs> uh, I designed a 6,400 square foot French potager garden at my campus at my college, and it supplies food for the dining center. Uh -huh. So, um, and I something we didn't have. Uh, we actually had to cart in water, so. I made Oya. So an Oya is, it's in a terracotta pot and that's how it's originally made. So it's an, in an unglazed terracotta pot. 
So I used a, you know, like this size, the big size of terracotta. Um, and I painted only the very top rim. Like I normally do it like white uh, so that, you know, it uh, reflects light back out to the plants. So you uh -huh. dig it into the soil and you cover only up to the painted part. And then you actually, you obviously close in the hole at the bottom and then you fill it with water and you have another terracotta, like the saucer, but terracotta and that's painted and you put it on top and now there's no evaporation. But now the you you put it right next to, or you plant afterwards. You plant around the oya, and the plants now go to the terracotta. The roots go to the terracotta, and it's deep. And you want deep roots because that's where all the moisture is. So they go yeah. in. And they basically attach themselves to the terracotta and soak the water out. Okay. So that she could also do it that way. Yeah, that's really cool. I might have to try that here and see how it does for me. Yeah, if you want to look them up there, it's it's uh, spelled O L L A. Okay. Oya. So that's how you, yeah, it's, it's O Y A. That's how it's pronounced. But yeah, you can buy them online. They're very beautiful, but very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I had college funds to pay, right? Right. I had like, they gave me a huge college fund to pay for it. And I was like, I am not spending that money on that. No way. <laughs> Oh man. All right. So again, talking about um, soil and stuff, someone was asking um, if soil has less nutrients, then does that mean that your fruit and vegetables are going to have less nutrients? And how do you test for nutrients and what should you do about that? Okay. So um, I think it's called a rapid test mm -hmm. on Amazon or any like hardware store or whatever. Um, it's a soil testing kit and it has for NPK and it tells you all the instructions that you need to do and, and what to look for to find out what exactly is in your soil. Do you hear the wind? Yes. That's wind? <laughs> yeah, that's the wind. It was whistling. I was like, what is that? That's the wind. <laughs> like the entire house is shaking right now. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't kidding about the 90 mile per hour winds. Oh my, I mean, do you get wind burnt when you go outside? <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, some days it'll pick up the sand and it will just like abrade your skin. Ow. <laughs> That's awful. It's awful. Yes, all right, I'll mute myself so the wind is not whistling and you can talk about the um, uh, nutrient testing for plants. Okay. Okay, so yeah, she, um, yeah, the rapid test. You find out what's in your soil. And then, and then from there, I, I mean, if she did that, I could tell her afterwards what she really needs to do. But I mean, really, I would like to know why she came up with this question. Like, is, is she, has she been growing and then nothing has been ha like happening or like, where did I this, think this you're talking about like the nutrients like in the plant, like you know your basic like what uh, NPK. Yeah, not that, not like fertilizer nutrients, but like what you eat and absorb, like vitamins and minerals and stuff like that. There we go. Those are the words I'm trying to think of. Um, okay. So like you know, like your vitamin A or whatever, vitamin C stuff like that. Your iron. Um, you have potassium of course in there but all of that like that the plant should have as like the daily recommended value for eating okay and like if there's a way if they should if she should do anything to make sure that the plants are like the most nutrient dense that they could be for a person to consume okay yeah she should add a, a compost organic matter to her soil just mix it in aerate it in and that will basically be it. So is there a way that you like to source compost or like a compost that you recommend people use? Um, well, I personally, I used to buy from a compost farm. Um, unfortunately, they uh, went out of business. <laughs> um, but now I'm buying basically 
bagged. I go through Fox Farm. It's organic forest. It's their bagged one and a half cubic feet. And it has um, all the stuff from the ocean that's good for you. Seaweed, kelp, all that stuff. All the microorganisms from the from the salt water. And yeah. And, and what I also, since I, I live on the Atlantic, like pretty close to the ocean type thing, not as close as Georgia, but... <laughs> Um, but I'm only 45 minutes away from the ocean. So <clears throat> I will go, um, early season and grab seaweed from the wash up and just bring it home. Just as no one sees me. They, they don't really like you to do that, but whatever, what are they going to do with it? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Uh, and it's free. So what better? And you just throw it in your garden and walk away and just let it decompose on its own. It's perfect. So if anyone out there lives near the ocean, go do that. Just do it at night or something. <laughs> <laughs> so they can't talk to you. Or like a very empty beach. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I know there's a lot of us with animals. So like I personally compost all of my animal manure, manure and everything like that. Like what I put in my garden this year is about four years old, just because I didn't do like a hot compost really with it. I just kind of let it sit for four years. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, and then the other thing, like I'm experimenting this year with a hot compost. So I've got the fresh manure that I've filled with water. I've got tubes that have holes in it throughout, and then I've covered it in a black tarp. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know if that's a correct way to do anything. I'm just kind of experimenting to see what happens. I think right now I'm at like one thirty in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. and I just started it like two weeks ago. So. Okay, so in order for everything to be killed off that would be harmful to us, it has to get to 170. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and but in order to get it to 170, you still have to aerate it. Yeah, I have, like I said, I've got tubes and then I blast air through with, uh, what's it called? I have my big air tank. Oh my. <laughs> I didn't want to turn it because it's so much. So I was just like, we're just going to try it like this. And see okay. What you have to video that. I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds hysterical. I definitely yeah. want to see it. I have my air compressor and I have PVC pipes that have holes in it. And so I just put the air compressor on the tube and just let it go. Huh, interesting. And are you using a compost thermometer to really correctly? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I have a big giant thermometer that goes down into it and everything. Okay. Great. Yeah, because yeah. um, you just want to be careful because you don't want, you want to make good compost, not toxic compost. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually teaching a class on composting in August. Yeah, I feel like that's something that would be so helpful for so many people. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people around here are just like, oh, I just throw it in the backyard and we'll see. And I'm like, oh, so you're going to go kill all your plants. That's great. Yeah. yeah, no, I had mine sit for four years, and the first time I got it wet, I had a thousand mushrooms pop up. Wow. Which was awesome. Um, they all died because there was no mulch or anything. I was not prepared right. for mushrooms of any kind. But. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, mushroom compost is great, too, if you mix it in with the ocean stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was the name again of the compost that you used that was? Fox Farm. Fox Farm. All right. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, taking yeah. little notes so I can add stuff into the description for people. Yeah, yeah. Fox Farm Ocean Forest. Okay. And then are there any other fertilizer things that you recommend people do? Well, I mean, I did write out a bunch of fertilizing basics. Um, mm -hmm. Like, yeah, uh, go through some of that. Yeah. So, um, like, I, I have some organic, uh, like, blood meal, um, many types of manure. Um, but you want to do that, like, two to six weeks before you're actually going to plant. Like, most people just, like, throw it in and then put their plants in. And it's like, oh, why aren't they really growing as fast as I thought? I'm like, oh, maybe because they're struggling. <laughs> um, you know Alfalfa and uh, clover, I, um, but again, two, that's actually two to six months before you plant. Like these are all things that you want to do throughout the year before you start mm -hmm. planting. Um, you know, fish emulsion, you know, it's available quick 
quickly to plants, but often it's it's used within two weeks. So people are always like, oh, fish emulsion, fish emulsion. I hear all the time on all these different gardening things I'm on, on Facebook and everything else. And everyone's like, fish emulsion. I'm just like, sure, you buy a vat of it. <laughs> then it'll be great for all summer season, if that's what you do. If you do a standard American garden, which is one season, sure. It's going to be expensive if you do three seasons. <laughs> But yeah, that's when I, I always just say, you know, why don't you just grab a fish and throw it in? Just fish, like a whole fish. But it's stinky, I know, but the the Native Americans did it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I um, we didn't have fish necessarily, but we had a really bad snowstorm before I planted my trees. And we had tons of birds that were dead in the yard. So I put them underneath all my trees. Wow. What happened yeah. to the birds? So they had already migrated up. They're a migrating bird and they had migrated up for the summertime and they just didn't know. I took as many into my barn as I could find and I had them like in my barn <laughs> and was feeding them until the snow left. But I, I just, there are so many of them. You can't find them all. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I saw the pictures. I was in awe of how much snow yeah. you guys got. We got, I think it total that weekend, I think we got almost 18 inches of snow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, and people say that climate change doesn't exist. <laughs> well, last year we had snow until almost the end of June. But that's very common. I'm at almost 7,000 feet where I live. So I'm like really high altitude here. Right. I'm originally from Northern Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. So my yeah. spot is, yeah, it's just so weird here compared to like the rest of Montana. It's a really weird climate. Yeah, just a weird microclimate spot. Exactly right. Yeah. So um, I also wrote out. So the main components, um, the NPK, the nitrogen, mm -hmm. and potassium. You know, I basically just wrote out uh, what each, um, what each one actually does for a plant. Yeah. So people are just like, oh, I'm just going to add it and that's it. So, you know, I said nitrogen, it helps with plant growth, you know, above ground. It, it does a great job of promoting the green leafy growth of foliage and it provides the necessary ingredients to produce lush green lawns if you need it for your lawn, <laughs> even though they're not sustainable. <laughs> uh, phosphorus, uh, it's very effective at establishing growth below the ground in the form of healthy root systems. Um, and it's also the you know, component for, uh, most responsible for flower blooms and fruit production. So if you're having an issue with that stuff, definitely add up the phosphorus. Potassium, it's considered, you know, the, one of the most important, I think nitrogen is really most important, but anyways, um, for overall plant health, you know, it's primarily due to its ability to help build strong cells, uh, with the plant tissue, which is essentially the same for humans. Um, you know, in turn, the plants withstand various stresses such as heat, cold, pest diseases. And uh, so, yeah, but um, for some organic, for uh, for nitrogen, it's, you know, dried blood, blood meal, cottonseed meal, fish emulsion, and seaweed extract. <laughs> and again, you can get the seaweed extract liquid. Like uh -huh. Fox Farm actually makes the liquid ones. But it's like, again, the container is only like this big. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's mostly so, like hydroponics, but. Yeah. Yeah. I have some hydroponic stuff too that I use. I just actually, I have one of the things that I can add to my drip system and it'll take it through the drip system, everything that I use. Um, so do you, do you grow hydroponics? No, no, it's, I, well, I did for a little while and then I have all the hydroponic fertilizers left over. So I'm just like, I'm just going to put it in my drip system and fertilize that way if I need to. Exactly. Um, yeah. Essentially, you know, um, basically they're all the same, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. right. So when it comes to providing nutrients for plants, um, the chemical makeup, uh, of natural versus synthetic um, is exactly the same. Even though I grow organic and I'm saying this, but really speaking from a from the chemical standpoint, they are exactly the same. And yeah. the plant does not know the difference. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, 
I don't promote using that stuff, but yeah, well, mine is, it's an organic um, liquid fertilizer set, right. so it's all organic stuff still. It's just been like liquid compost growth. It smells. No, I, I'm not saying to you. <laughs> yeah, other forms that are just other like forms, you know, yeah. ground up. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so actually, one thing because I've seen people um, ask questions about it many times, and I've answered some things on it because I've dealt with it, um, but like squash bugs and stuff like that mm -hmm. you, i i don't have to deal with them anymore thankfully um <laughs> but i i've noticed a couple of posts that i've been approving lately um it just like popped in my head have been about like squash bugs and then weeds in between and like the weeds attracting different insects and stuff like that <laughs> well if you mulch around it's your good. vegetables you're really not going to have a lot of weeds you'll still have weeds yes. you still have to weed regardless yeah. um unless you're on a deck like me i don't have weeds but um uh, <laughs> that they said they'll find a way oh yeah i know no i have to deal with a squirrel <laughs> oh. um so yeah mulch i mean and do the weeding and if you see the squash bugs immediately remove them and squish them and put them away somewhere yeah I mean, don't do what I'm. I'm thinking of doing. My my neighbors think I'm a little crazy sometimes when I when I say things like I'm gonna wring his neck and then hang him from my deck as a warning to all his friends. <laughs> don't do something like that. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, I took care of the uh, squirrel. I um, WD forty the gutters. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was fun to watch him. <laughs> That's an, oh, I would, I don't have to deal with squirrels anymore either, thank goodness, but when I did. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah I, I, you know, I'm a citizen scientist as well for Cornell University for the lab of morphology, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm on a lot of bird watching stuff, and uh, yeah, they're always saying, use WD-40 on your, on your bird, you know, your, your bird feeders and your shepherd's hooks. They're like, you'll get a good watch. <laughs> Wonder if it works for gutters. It does. <laughs> if I ever deal with squirrels again, I'm totally trying that. That's awesome. Um, okay, so another question that we had was um, companion planting and what to plant together and what not to plant together. Yeah. So people like to plant um, marigolds with their their garden because they're like oh it keeps the bugs away they really don't um <laughs> old wives tale <clears throat> uh in order for them to help your garden they actually have to die and then you mulch them into your soil and then the chemical that's in them will leach into your soil and then that will kill the nematodes that are in your soil and that's about it that's all they do so even growing them next to it, people are like, oh, but the bugs are attracted to that and they'll eat that. Yeah, yeah, technically speaking, they will do that, but they don't add any special chemicals to the roots to the rest of your soil, like so many people think. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I have a huge list of companion planting because mm -hmm. I, that's what I do as a consultant. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I can uh, post something yeah, because it's yeah. it's too lengthy for me to yeah. pull it out. Right? Um, are there just like a couple like really major ones that come to mind? Tomatoes and basil. Okay. So in one in in the community garden that I'm that I designed last year and I'm doing this year again. Um, in one of the beds, it's uh, actually I think I have it <laughs> in in my album here. I can just find it real quick. And um, so, yeah, so I have in one of the beds, this is all companion. So in one bed, I have cucumbers, beets, onions, borage, and sunflowers. You always want to make sure that you do have flowers in your, in your beds because of, you know, the pollinators. And then my second bed, it's zucchini, butternut, squash, green beans, borage, tomatoes, and basil. So 
Yeah. Those, those are all really good things. They're two separate beds. Um, and in between those two beds, I have an experiment bed going on, uh, which is hay. It's the Ruth Stout, De Ruth Stout method. Okay. And then on the other side of one of the beds, it's using straw instead as the Ruth Stout method. See which one works best. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I have um, a bunch of flowers that are wrapped around all those beds, but strictly it's for, it's not for anything regarding the companion planting. It's just for like wildflowers for picking and all that stuff. Yeah. But the big things people are always asking about are cucumbers, tomatoes, basil. And that's why I was, you know, those are definitely, and I know a lot of people um, will do, you know, it's the, they call it the three sisters, but it's really the yeah. four sisters, right? So, you know, um, so corn, uh, zucchini, beans, and then a sunflower is your fourth sister. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, one of the things I did want to ask too, because I've seen some people complaining about corn pollination in a small garden. Okay. Do you have any advice for that? Because I know corn is wind pollinated for the most part. Um, I do hill planting and haven't had problems with corn, but mm -hmm. I don't know if people are doing just like general rows and only doing like one row and not having success. I'm not sure how they're doing it, but. Um, well, yeah. I know I, I know several gardeners that have large gardens um, on their properties. It's nothing like a farm. It's just a standard garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they all plant corn, all different varieties. Um, I know one actually does do, because I got that for him, it's the Iroquois uh, white corn that you can only get from upstate New York. So um, yeah, he grows it in square, square, like square foot and there's, mm -hmm. and they're tightly woven in there, but that's how the Iroquois actually told him to yeah. practice. Yeah. So literally square foot and they're, and you, when you're driving by his property, you can see the corn. And it's not a lot of it, but it's you can definitely tell that it's in, in blocks. Yeah. So that's how he does his. Yeah. So I guess that would be similar to like the hill planting that I do where I put like, I guess I do with something like this and it's about 15 corn per block or so, like per little section. Mm -hmm. And then I do like three or four close to each other and then have but you're in hill. Well, it's called hill planting, but it's not really a hill. That's just what I grew up calling it. Um, okay. I don't know why, but that's what like in the South, like the like I grew up uh, with a lot of Cherokee influence and they would call it like hill planting. So you put like all your squash, they call it like a hill of squash, or, like a hill of corn or a hill of whatever. Um, okay, because I mean, pumpkins and all that stuff yeah. is grown on a hill, so yeah. Yeah, like it, it's this basic concept for corn too. Um, it's not technically on a hill. It is a little bit raised up from everything right. else just because of the way I've planted it and the way that I've done, but mm -hmm. it's not like a huge hill. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You learn different things about how different parts of the country. Yeah. You know, what they're all calling it. It's like, oh, well, we call it, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they called it hill. I'm sure it probably did originate growing on top of a hill. And then, you know, they just like translated it to like clumps in a garden. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, exactly. Well, it's kind of like um, I read recently when I was doing my some of my research for trellising, um, the Florida weave trellis. I've never even heard about this trellising, but I was just like, all right, this is interesting. What's this? And I looked it up and I was like, oh, okay. That's a cage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. Those Floridians, they're kind of weird. <laughs> Sorry if anyone is from Florida, but <laughs> they're mostly all New Englanders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people from the north that moved down there. Yeah, snowbirds. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, the next one we've got is like tilling versus no-till for a larger plot. No-till. Um, tilling kills the micro, you know, microorganisms that are in that first six inches of soil. There are six to eight inches that has all the nutrients that you need to grow in. And basically you're just going in and you're ripping it apart. 
and there goes your, your, your biomes like out the window and now you just kind of have soil, that's it. So no, no till. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just what, adding compost on every year and stuff like that? Yep, just go in and, I mean, if it's a brand new plot and you've never grown on it before and it was like pastures for like years and everything else, then I can understand that you need to go in with a rototiller to break everything up. And you, mm -hmm. need to, you need to physically make what you want, right? Okay, fine. You have to get in there somehow. Um, but after that, you don't need to till anymore. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm used to that with raised beds, you know. We can't till a raised bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, you can lift the soil up and maybe air it a bit with a pitchfork, but... Yeah. I, I wouldn't know. All right, let me hop on and see if we have any other good questions. Oh, I actually did have one. So I heard you like mention nematodes earlier as like the like the bad kind of nematode. Hmm. How do you feel about like, beneficial nematodes and stuff like that? Because I've used those personally for ants because we have an ant problem. Um, but have you see, have you seen success using that for like a natural pest? control for some of the nastier grubs and stuff like that in the ground? Uh, for ants and silverfish and all those gross, creepy things, um, <laughs> uh, I use uh, diatomaceous earth. That is the best stuff. And that would be your ant issue. I would get that. Mm -hmm. That's organic. It's Omri and the whole nine yards. And all it is is, you know, million year old silica organisms from the ocean. And they basically have ground up. And yeah, it basically sucks the moisture out of their ecosystems and just like they die. That's it. So, um, but I do use compost tea and that has <laughs> beneficial organic nematodes that I used for foliar sprays for like aphids and all that other stuff on yeah. some, like in gardens, not up here. And that worked great. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, um, Oh, I can't remember what we had a few years ago. It was something bad and I, it was on the plants and I did the beneficial nematode spray and it was like amazing <laughs> yeah. for it. It was like gone. So, Absolutely know if you'd had experience with it too um mm -hmm. it's something i always recommend to people when they have pest problems i'm like see what its natural predator is and <laughs> introduce that to your garden too exactly um, it's like yeah. you know it's uh equivalent to batman <laughs> 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 for the villains out there um so yeah, I yeah I use compost tea with the nematodes, and you just want to make sure that your compost tea is constantly brewing and aerating and everything else, mm -hmm. and put it in, use it as a foliar spray, and it works awesome. Yeah, but your ant issue because I'm dealing with an ant issue at the community garden, diatomaceous earth. Yeah, I'll have to try some. I mean, it's so bad. Like, I mean, every six inches across my entire fifty acres, there's an ant hill. Yeah. Yeah, I would just do it where you're growing and like yeah. close to your house and everything else. And they yeah. come with like a little sprayer. Just make okay. sure that you're wearing a, a face protecting yeah. silica um, and spray it near your house and the garden and everything else. Trust me, you will see a world difference. I have to definitely do that for the side garden now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, and the chickens are not putting a dent in the ant population at all. You know, they you need a lot more chickens. I have 40. Oh my God. <laughs> you all these eggs every day. <laughs> How many children do you have? I have two kids, and then we have 40 chickens, 20 horses, two cows, and 10 goats. What do you do with all those horses? Um, I. Uh, train and rescue horses for therapeutic riding. Okay. All right. Yeah, my aunt does um, horse rehab for dressage and race horses in Vermont. That's intense. Yeah. 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 She has a uh, uh, what is it? Um, a huge vibe plate that the horses walk into, and they stand there for a half hour, and their whole body vibrates. Uh, that she goes into every night. It's quite interesting. That's where she does her paperwork. <laughs> Or um, 
uh, a swimming pool for them, and she also has a treadmill for them. Yeah. I have all of those things. It's, it's literally PT for a horse. Yes. Um, okay, I'm just kind of going through and seeing if we have any other questions that we want to look at. Someone here was asking, they get lots of leafy growth on their plants, but they don't get like a lot of flowers or fruiting. Okay, so um, yeah, so then they would, would definitely need, you know, the phosphorus. Okay, and that's usually like, isn't that like high nitrogen usually if they're getting like a ton of the leafy stuff? Yeah, so if they're feeding their, um, they need to see what they're feeding what they're using, if natural, whatever, and lay off on that and definitely get something with a more um, high phosphorus, which is bone meal or rock phosphate they can put into it and that will definitely help it out. Okay. Um, okay, this, like nobody asked this, but I do know we have quite a few like vegetarian vegan people in the group. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if there is any way that those people can garden without using animal products um, you know, like, I, I i wouldn't know how but just <clears throat> an interesting thought maybe to not necessarily answer that right now but maybe in the future or something um well i mean for the nitrogen they can use cotton seed meal and it depends on what kind of vegetarian they are whether or not they mm -hmm. want to use the fish emulsion um or the seaweed extract okay uh, the phosphorus, they can use the rock phosphate uh, and potassium. Um, there's sulfate or potash, or which is basically seaweed or um, and green sand. Okay. Yeah. You know, I just yeah, you know, is rock yeah. Or they can take uh, for potassium. They can also do a potassium water. So they can just take their banana peels, stick them into a big canning jar, cover it with water for 24 hours remove the peels and then water everything with that. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause I know that's something that's not really ever addressed for a lot of people. So yeah, uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll write that down and yeah. uh, see if I can come up with some. Yeah, you definitely need a website to store all of your things. No, I need a blog. I know, trust me. <laughs> I have so many people that keep bugging me about that. <laughs> I mean, if you have it all, you can just put it maybe like a file share or something that people could access with your files. True. That might be an easier way. That way it's not something you have to like upkeep all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, I have a lot of, um, they're essentially white papers. You know what the white papers are? Mm -mm. No. Um, in the science world, whenever you write a traditional paper um and you're it's peer reviewed it's called a white paper um, okay a lot of those from all my my many classes that i've taken um so those a lot of those could actually go into that blog and they're already written so yeah well i think that's pretty much the basis of the questions for today i don't want to like i mean we could probably talk about plants for you know eight hours but <laughs> I still I have to go back to that post that I wrote and I know I still have tons of questions to answer from people is that it's growing season right now and it's I'm yeah. still in. Yeah. So I really think like if you just had files you could just direct people over there and be like, go peruse. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be an awesome resource for everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us on here today and answering questions for everyone. And anyone who joined during the live or is coming after, thank you so much. And I hope that this was helpful and educational for you guys because it was very helpful for me just to learn even more. Um, even though I sit there and do research all the time by myself. <laughs> I'm the person that pulls up the scientific studies and then reads them so I can learn more. <laughs> There you go. I do that every single day. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so, so, so much for doing this. It was so much fun. And I'm sure everyone's going to have a million more questions. So we might have to do another one with you if you're up for it another day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm doing lots of presentations for the Massachusetts libraries. Um, oh, cool. So yeah, and anyone can actually sign up for those. Doesn't matter where you are. 
in the country. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, if you want to send me information for those things too, I can put that in the description for everyone so that they can kind of see different things that you've done and have another resource for people to look at. Sure. Yeah, I'm doing that composting class on August 16th. So when I get the link, I'll let you know. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that will be great, I'm sure. Um, I know that's something that all of us people that homestead are very interested in most of the yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm gearing this towards people that are at home and so on and so forth. It's not anything like commercial compost, which I know about as well, but yeah. Well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast now.